Greetings. Today we're going to check out this LED emergency light fitting and, well, pick holes in the design really. Going to the label, it's an EBL EDM3 apparently made by Niglon. Not to be confused with the EBL EDM3 made by Tamlight, nor the EBL EDM3 sold by Mr. Resistor and, funny enough, not to be found on the Niglon website. In fact, it's closer to an Elro or Robus unit, which are close enough to each other for me to think they probably all come from the same factory. The reason I've got this here to look at is because it's what appears to be a disposable light fitting. The data sheets give a three year warranty and a four year battery life. But what then? Let's take a look at an older fitting first and then we'll compare. This is one of the more familiar emergency exit sign designs with an eight watt fluorescent tube inside. This one was made by Memvier. As you can see, if I pop it open, Interestingly, without the use of any tools. You can see it's got a fairly basic driver circuit here and a battery pack made of two nickel cadmium D cells. The lights are meant to be regularly tested and if they can't stay lit for at least three hours without power, the batteries can be simply replaced. Here are two, three and four cell sticks for various lights. I've got an emergency light fitting under the stairs with a consumer unit, that's a two cell unit as well and still working fairly well despite being over 15 years old, although it falls short of the three hour mark these days. This one is a maintained switched fitting which has two supplies, one permanent to keep the battery charged and detect a power failure, the other switched so the light can be used as normal. The Menvier and Niglon are also maintained versions although the Niglon doesn't have the extra live feed so it's meant to be on all the time. Another common variant is the non-maintained lamp, which is normally off and only comes on if the power fails. Anyway, back to that LED fitting. What happens when the battery can no longer manage the three hours required? Surely it just gets changed like the old fittings, right? Well, let's see what's involved in that. But first of all, let's try it out to see if it even works. I've even got a Niglon 3 amp fuse to match the fitting. Well, the fuse is intact because you can hear it crackling, but the light doesn't want to light and it's not drawing any power whatsoever. But let's just assume that the light actually did work and we just need to change the batteries. Is it that straightforward? Well, let's find out. First of all, this can be removed to make the whole thing less cumbersome. And the covers can fall off the end because they're not actually fastened in place. This end has a button on it which does, I have no idea what that button does. And you can see in here then you've got the LED strip and the battery. And the battery is actually stuck down, it's not stuck down at the moment because I've actually peeled it off, it's stuck down with double sided foam pad onto the, onto the circuit board. So, do you just remove the circuit board? Well, let's see what's involved in that. At the other end, we've got a bolted down earth connection and the mains cable coming in. We're going to assume that we're going to actually reuse this. So I'm going to pop out that cord grip. We will also assume that it's been completely disconnected so that you can actually get the cable through the hole. Let's undo that as well. So with those out, it should be possible to feed the whole assembly out through the end. As long as you actually feed the cable in as you do so. And this is what we get. A three cell 600 milliamp hour stick, a driver board and 11 LEDs on a strip. This strip has got self-adhesive backing, they're just not bothered peeling the backing strip off. So it's meant to just slide into place in the, uh, in the aluminium. 
Here's a nice high-res photo of the boards, front and back. And if you examine the back closely, you'll see why it got thrown out. And it's not to do with the high-handed danger that's apparently underneath the choke. There's a big gob of solder there, shorting out a resistor. And another one. That one's shorting out a diode in the mains voltage section. Here's the schematic. And as you can see, I've marked where those solder blobs are. I suspect that's caused the transistors to stay on and short the supply. There's no actual input fuse, just a skinny bit of PCB track to act as one. But instead of that blowing, it's just nuked the neutral winding of the input choke. So much for quality control. If this has been tested, surely it shouldn't have even left the factory. Moving briefly onto the test button board, you can see that the yellow P LED doesn't actually have anything supplying it, so it's never going to light up. The red C and green T LEDs have their own resistors, but they share a supply, so you're never going to see one on without the other. These have their own feed from a resistor on the main board, and the test button just shorts this out to ground, presumably dragging the other supplies down to simulate the power failure. Q6 to Q8 appear to be a battery charging circuit, and I think the way this works is that Q7 will turn Q6 on, which brings up the voltage heading out through D11. If it goes too high, the Zener will break down, turning Q8 on, and reducing the gate voltage on Q7 to bring the voltage back down. Q10 controls the supply of power from the battery to the LED strip. When mains is available, D12 will be keeping the cathode of D13 higher than the battery supply, and keeping Q10 switched off. Q9 will be turned on by that same supply, plus the LED supply via ZD4, but it's obviously no match for that supply coming straight through the diode. If mains fails, though, it looks to me as though it's got to rely on Q9 staying on long enough to be able to turn on Q10 and get that battery power flowing through, and it should then sustain this via ZD4 until it stops conducting because the battery voltage is too low, and should then just turn off. That would explain to me why I've been able to charge the battery out of circuit but still can't actually get it to light. I think it, it needs that mains power just to get the initial switch on. So, if I fix the obvious faults on the board, can I force it to run from battery if I briefly join the battery supply to the LED supply? Here's the board sort of fixed, with the solder blobs removed and the filter choke replaced with a pair of jumper wires. As you can see, two of the pins, when I took the choke out, they stayed on the board because they weren't even connected to the winding. Whether that had burnt out or just more shoddy workmanship, I don't know. But can I jump start it? Let's see. It's going to be those middle two connections there. Hey, there we go. I've pulled out the main supply transistors for testing and they check out okay. So will it work on the mains now? Let's try that as well. I'll use the Variac to ramp it up, just in case. Wow, 20 volts. That's triggered it. Although, that's interesting. If you take the voltage up a little higher, it realizes that there's power there and switches back to the mains, but the main supply isn't really up to much carp at the moment. So it's actually better running on battery. Anyway, let's take it back up properly. There we go. Switch it off. As you can see, the two lights are on on there because they always are. If I push the button, shorts the lights out, and simulates power failure, which obviously that won't do now. So there you have it, some odd little design features, such as LEDs that aren't even wired. Plus, as you can see, it's not really designed for the battery to be replaced. You're expected to just toss the whole thing in the bin and buy another one. In this case, it didn't work at all, so the contractors just tossed the whole thing in the bin and bought another one. But I digress. I've got no use for it, so I'm just going to salvage all the components off it. Hope you found some tidbits of interest in this video. Thanks for watching. <laughs>